Welcome to Investing Insights, partnered by Right Property Group. This is your host, Phil Tarrant. G'day, everyone. Welcome to Investing Insights, the Right Property Group. I'm your co-host, Phil Tarrant. Thanks for joining us again uh, in the studio, back by popular demand. Victor Kumar, Director, Right Property Group. How are you going, Victor? I'm good, Phil. I'm Steve Waters. Uh, you're just back because uh, we just need someone to fill the shoes of uh, someone more talented. How are you going, mate? <laughs> Would that be you? Probably. <laughs> <laughs> You've been I'll well? take that. Been well. Been well. What's been going on, guys? Nothing, mate. Phil, I was a bit disappointed that I didn't get any sledging from the last uh, podcast while I wasn't here. You must be getting soft with the old age. Well, I don't like to give people a hard time behind their back. I like them to be able to respond immediately when I give them a hard time. So that's the way I like to roll. You know, I'm not a backstabbing type of bloke. I, I had you back, Vic. He wanted to go all yeah. in, but I said, no, 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 no. He's I believe here. that, Steve. I absolutely believe I, that. I, I'm a modern man. I, I like to inspire um, rather than to uh, to sledge and degrade. So, um, Victor, it's good to see you looking well. Were you looking relaxed after your trip to, uh, I think, Fiji? Family, pleasure, bit of both? Bit of both, yeah. bit of both. How's it changed over there? So, so you, um, your story, and I think you shared it beforehand, um, maybe not on this podcast, but some other stuff. You you you, you have a background. You're, you're from Fiji and you mm-hmm. came out here about 15 years ago. 1997. 1997. Has it changed much over there? Uh, it's changed substantially, and, yeah. and um, uh, that, that's what happens in any country, I suppose, as um, education comes through, new generation comes through, new thinking comes through. People do get a lot more cluey around money, mm. and um, particularly with people that had migrated from Fiji at that back then, they're all now starting to go back and start businesses or have holiday homes and all this sort of stuff. And so that's changed the economy quite a, quite a bit. Mm. So you do see that uh, when you go back to Fiji. Do you always look at property when over there or you try and uh, stop yourself from looking at – because all the real estate agents are over there. All the Australian banks are there. All the Australian mm-hmm. real estate franchises are there. Do you find yourself looking in the um, – uh, the real estate windows of Suva or Nandy going, oh, that looks all right, or stay well away. <laughs> Look, a- any, any holiday we go, regardless of where we go, uh, naturally we gravitate towards the uh, real estate windows uh, mm. to see you know, what the market is doing there and um, you know, what opportunities we can identify just being on the ground then and there. But mm. you know, the idea is that even if you're on a holiday, you want to make sure that you uh, divorce the holiday and the buying. Otherwise, <laughs> you end up buying from your heart rather than your head. Yeah, and we've spoken about a lot of people, um, their biggest mistake they often make in property investment is that they actually buy a holiday home or some sort of service apartment. Steve, that sounds familiar, um, buying in locations where um, it's good to rent rather than uh, rent for two weeks of the year rather than buy. It's very familiar mm. for me, but not just for me, but also for Vic. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's a great mistake to to make, I mm. think, at the end of the day. Yeah. Anyway, we could probably do a, a podcast on buying uh, holiday homes for the for the purpose of investment, but I think we should probably leave that for another time. What I want to uh, go through today, guys, I've been curating all these questions that you've been receiving over the last sort of three, four months, and I thought we could do a Q&A session, answer some of these questions that uh, our listeners have been um, uh, sending in. Are you guys right for that? We're going to go off the yeah. cuff? Yep, yeah. up for it. Absolutely. Yeah. You sure? Absolutely. Let's do it. You're not renowned for thinking on your feet. I know you like to prepare Do you like for this? Like, in you're just back, Vic, <laughs> and he's sledging me because I had your back then. I stuck up for you and see how it's a swap. Right, and, and I'm just letting it happen, mate. I know, right? <laughs> it's my job to, to put a, like a rift between you two guys. I want to see you kick off here in the podcast room. Rift or riff? Rift. Okay. Like, like the great Rift Valley. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I just thought you were going to yeah. rap again. No, no, no. I'm not a rapper. I'm a, I don't have a musical bone in my body, Just Steve. for the listeners, though, before we kicked off, he did. you did rap a little. I did. I can rap. I'm, uh, and he also did the Stevie Wonder as well. I did. Yeah, a bit I of Lionel yeah, Richie as well. Talents. Anyway, mm-hmm. anyway. I doubt people want to hear us talking about this stuff. Let's get to some actual intelligent in- information for our listeners because <laughs> it's important. All right, here's the first question, and and I haven't looked at these. I've just been giving them to me. So the reason why is that I want a nice, authentic uh, response to these, and um, I'll, I'll tell you what I think straight away, but I'm not the person here who's knowledgeable. Uh, Steve and Victor in the studio, they live and breathe property. That's uh, my job to steer this conversation. So I'll do it with the first question. Hi, Steve and Victor. I listen to your podcast religiously, and thanks for the excellent information. That's nice. Uh, I've read many articles showing that the city market is slowing down. Given that I have a few properties here, plus my principal place of residence, what do I do? One, do I sell and buy elsewhere? Two, is this the right time to buy more property in Sydney? Uh, that's from Adam from Ride. Thanks for the question, Adam. Uh, Burton, I think you're probably thinking what a lot of people are thinking right now. Victor, it's doom and gloom in the city market. There's blood on the streets. Uh, everyone's losing their money. It's a, the property prices are plummeting. There's, mm-hmm. you know, the sky's falling in. I think it's dropped by between one and five percent, depending where you are. So it is a crash. 
Is it really a crash or is it just, you know, normalising? Look, it's, it's just normalising. It is just the market cycles at work. Uh, and obviously with the impact with how we're travelling with finance uh, and uh, the fact that you know, we, we had a really good, strong run. And to, just to put it in perspective, we've had up to 75% gains in the recent years. And if we're going back 5, 10, even 20%, it's no big deal so, because property is always a long-term thing. So long as it's not impacting lifestyle while we're holding on to that property, uh, you should be able to ride out the cycles and you will always have uh, the ups and downs. Uh, and, and just like uh, any cycle, as it goes towards a peak, then it starts coming down and then it normalizes. And, and particularly in Sydney market, we're not at GFC levels. I mean, yes, there were, there were um, headlines saying that, you know, bigger than the last GFC, um, falls bigger than the last GFC. Uh, but it's all relative. You need to look at what baseline you're operating off and, and then decide whether it is doom, or, doom and gloom. So it's only really an issue, <clears throat> the current city market is if you, number one, can't hold the property, mm. or number two, you, you're forced to, to make an exit of some sort. So if you're forced to sell, and typically you're forced to sell either through personal circumstances or situation or a cash flow problem. Correct. So yeah. people who are struggling in a cash flow situation right now, what sort of options do they have in order to try and hold the property? Because if you've realised, you know, 70% growth and it's come mm. back by 5%, that's still 65% that's right. growth. That's, that's exactly not right. bad, right? Mm. You know, so what do you do? Well, it depends on depends on when they've bought it and whether they have actually realised that gain. Mm. Uh, so if they've just bought it and they've bought it and they've just gone wrong within the first, say, 12 months, yeah, um, I, I think that... Um, they may be in for a little bit of hurt uh, in any market, right? Regardless of whether it is uh, Queensland, Brisbane, Queensland and Brisbane are the same, yeah. obviously. Uh, you know whether it's Queensland, whether it's Victoria, whether it's Sydney, or any other state, right? So if you've just bought the property, usually within the first twelve months, you're not in the money, even even uh, if the market is travelling upwards. Uh, of course, it depends on how uh, you know how much of a discount you've bought for and all that sort of stuff. But if, if that's not the case and they've held it for a little bit, a little bit longer, then I think it, they're just worrying for nothing. Mm. To mitigate whether um, you know, you, you're going to take a bath on this or not, you need to learn to recognize these signs well ahead of time. And, and Steve, we, we often talk about um, you know, managing the cash flow and, and looking after the cash flow and um, letting the equity handle itself in the background. And that, that's what needs to happen at this stage. Well, there's an argument here, Steve, I think this um, Adam is saying, do I sell and buy now? So do you realise the upswing in value now? Because you're probably not going to get any growth for quite some time and go and use that money to buy property or so is what he's asking. So you need to replace it. What do you think about that strategy? Considering that, to Victor's mm. point, that, that you can maintain a cash flow. So say if cash flow is not a problem, should you sell down now, take some money off the table, buy somewhere else to try and get that same growth? Because it's Sydney, my short answer is no. Mm. It's a world-class city. It's not a regional area. So there's a lot of costs associated with getting out of a property and then getting back into a property. And because he's an investor and you know, if he follows the cycle, eventually he'll probably want to get back into Sydney again. I'm a fan of keeping properties in Sydney. It's You just don't get a chance to get back in at the same price point. If, however, it was a regional area and there are some of our clients that we mm -hmm. are advising to sell properties in different areas because they've outperformed themselves and they are regional areas. So mm. you, you have to look at the long-term average. Sydney, for me, no. Hang on to your properties. Over the next 100 years, it will continue to do well for you and it has since you know, Captain Cook got here. Talking about the largest concentration of population in Australia. 100%. So, you know, yep. it, it's, it's the supply and demand at play over here. So would you say that any city property, if it's been purchased well and it's got all the basic fundamentals, should be the jewel and crown of any Australian-based property? I'm not, I'm not sure that it. I'd call it the jewel and the crown. Mm. I just think it is a, it's a great asset to the portfolio or to the stable, so okay. to speak. And just remember, like Sydney's a little bit different from Brisbane and Melbourne, uh, being that we're boxed in. We're boxed in by national parks, mountains and ocean, uh, whereas say, uh, Melbourne or, or Brisbane... Go on forever. They can go on forever. There's a lot of green field, if you will, and mm. so they can keep going and going and going. So we're hemmed in, which puts uh, ample pressure on supply. Uh, we know that immigration here is high. We know population growth is very high. Mm -hmm. 
it'll just put pressure on prices as the years unfold. Okay, so I guess a lot of this is going to come down to, to your strategy. If your strategy is the buy and hold, you should be keeping properties if you can maintain them. Got that sorted out. But the second part of this question from Adam is, is it the right time to buy more property in Sydney? Short answer, always keep your eyes open mm. uh, because there's always an opportunity uh, any day of any week. I would probably suggest we are getting very close or closer to the time to strike again. Okay, and why is that? I just see that the consumer confidence out of the market is it, it's starting to contract mm. uh, very quickly as well. And we still have the, the, the good fundamentals. So we still have population growth. We still have cheap money, if you can get it. Yeah. And while that consumer confidence is low, and as long as you pick the right area that's not oversupplied, not just now, but oversupplied in terms of what's in the pipeline for construction over the next six to 12 months, there could be some opportunity as perhaps the unsophisticated buyer or the un- uh, unsophisticated investors may have leveraged too hard, may have gone in too deep. Uh, there might be some opportunity, but not today, but it might be tomorrow or next month or next year. So, Victor, what's going to be the one or two signals that you're going to see that's going to spark your interest in buying more property in Sydney? Look, I'm starting to see the first snippets of it in the sense that the agents that I was dealing with in the last cycle, they're starting to reach out slowly. Okay. Uh, but surely. So um, there's real estate agents chasing you saying, hey, I've got a great, great property here. No, no, no. I think they're reading what's what's on the on the, on the the ground and uh, they're reaching out and starting to rekindle that um, uh, relationship in that sense to uh, make sure that I'm there when it, when, when they've got the stock okay. uh, that they need to move. Certainly, uh, the other thing to look at is the um, uh, rental yields uh, are starting to climb up again, slowly but surely. Uh, and uh, the um, uh, you know, there's a lot of construction that was approved but they're actually starting to take a step back because of finance most likely they're starting to take a step back to say do we build now or do we uh, wait wait it out yeah that brings me to the point where when you look at all of these markets it's it's a it's a cycle right we we get into a point where we've all taken a panic and 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 uh, we stop building we uh, stop buying uh, and there becomes uh, this great um, tipping point where you've got rents that are being pushed up because there aren't enough properties being built. Stock starts drying up in the, on the on the ground, and that starts the cycle again. And then we start building, and then we build too much. Mm. We build too much, and then it comes to that tipping point where the supply tips the other way, where you've got too many properties and too many rental uh, properties available, and then people ease back again. And so I, I think we are at that point in Sydney uh, right now where. We've built in, in in most areas. We've built a bit too many, or we've um, got a n- lot of new properties that have hit the market, and it's uh, come to a point where uh, there is that oversupply seeping in in some areas. Therefore, it'll then uh, mean that for the next say couple of months or couple of years, who knows, uh, we will be in a relatively flat market before it takes off again. Okay, and uh, myself and Steve, this when uh, you, you weren't here last time, uh, Victor. We we did a podcast. Uh, go and check it out. Twenty seventh of July. It's called Aspiring Market or Just Media Spin, and we spoke at length around um, the, the doomsday predictions of the media of the mm. Sydney property market and actually putting that into perspective. Sydney property is softening, but it's not falling off a cliff by any means. I think the terminology, it's, it's softening. It's uh, not tumbling, as some mm. uh, some media commentators or outlets will, will oh, we have gave you believe. We had a bit of a hard time when we spoke about it last We month. did, and there was a bit yeah. of feedback on that as yeah. well because – uh, some of those commentators said, well, yeah, show us the proof that it's not tumbling, and, mm. and we did that. Uh, but it isn't tumbling. Mm. It's it's just a softening in some areas. And I think we can break it into three levels. We can – the top end of the market, the middle, and the and the base, or the, the more affordable corridors, the cheaper stuff. Uh, the top end has certainly come off by anywhere between 5 to 10%. Some would say a little bit more. Mm. Uh, the middle has come off a little bit, and the, and the bottom has come off a little bit. But they're certainly not tumbling. You know, if we talk 2 3 4 5% just as an average – uh, as you said earlier on, Vic, if we've if we've had seventy five percent gain in a very short period of time, and you've come back or you've contracted five percent, it's not the end of the world. As long as you were controlled in the way that you kept those properties uh, yeah. in terms so of back to cash flow, and cash flow, board, equity, yeah. buffers, mm-hmm. um, All that stuff and, really- and but also being realistic, just knowing that it's not going to be uh, yeah, blue sky growth forever and ever. It, it we'll give it, you'll make a bit, you'll give a bit back. Okay, good. Let's move on. Uh, Rob from Adelaide asks this question. Uh, I've heard you guys talk about longevity. What do you mean by that? And what are the things I should do to be able to be a successful investor? Victor, longevity, what's that mean? Staying in the game for a long time? 
Absolutely. It means that you know you're looking after uh, the fundamentals, um, so that you're looking at uh, the liquidity of the property, the liquidity of your portfolio. Uh, in other words, if it ran into trouble, that you can offload the properties or correct your cash flow without having to compromise on lifestyle or uh, you know uh, going going to the bare bones in terms of losing everything. Mm. That's what I look at in terms of longevity. In other words, the properties that you buy, the portfolio that you create is in line with your financial fingerprint. So it, it, it's affordable to you. So you're not competing with someone else. You're not competing or, or investing via textbook. Mm. Uh, you're actually uh, investing via metrics. In other words, looking at your own capabilities how much capital you've got, how much uh, cash flow tolerance, negative cash flow tolerance you've got, you know, whether you are a rapid decision maker or do you want to take a more sedate pace and therefore that determines the type of property you buy, the areas you buy. Okay. And, and Steve, I'm not going to turn to you on that one. Um, uh, Rob, go to the uh, Rob Property website, which is robpropertygroup.com.au. And I know Victor and Steve have written a lot about that in the past. So there's some really good blogs there. Go and check it out. And I think uh, if you add that to what Victor said, you'll start to frame your mindset around longevity a little bit better. Um, there's a lot of questions here, so I want to make sure we cover as many as possible. And Steve, I'm going to put this one to you. Um, and I've got some observations around it as well. It's from S. Sharma who asks, I'm looking to engage a buyer's agent and have been talking to quite a few people and I'm not sure what to use as a deciding factor. What are the things I should look out for? Uh, looking for a totally transparent answer. Okay, I'll give you a, a, my totally transparent answer. Uh, a buyer's agent is everyone. You know, you don't need to use a buyer's agent. Um, if you feel as though as an investor, you've got all the, the skills and capabilities to purchase property well, and that means um, understanding markets, understanding fluctuating markets, understanding macro and microeconomic factors, understanding how to negotiate and deal with real estate agents, understand how to manage your property, all these type of things, you can go do yourself. And I know some people that do that very, very well. So don't feel as though that you need to use a buyer's agent. However, it's good that you're thinking about using a buyer's agent and some very, very good buyer's agents in Australia and it's an emerging industry as well. So we're fortunate that it's a growing sector and I think over time we're going to have more and more Australians, both investors and owner-occupied people, using buyer's agents to buy properties. So don't feel as though you have to use one. If you feel as though you've got the capabilities to go out and do it yourself, please explore that option. But Steve, what should be the deciding act factor of what buyer's agent should you want to use one to determine whether they're right for you. First of all, I'd agree with everything that you just said. Mm. Um, yep, a lot of people can do this themselves, and the people that can't do it themselves either don't have the right skill set, and they acknowledge that, yeah. or they're just time poor. Time poor. Yeah, and I, and I fall into oh, look, I fall into both camps personally. Like, if I wanted to dedicate all my time to buying property, I'm sure I could probably get better at it. But you know, there's still yeah. people out there better at doing it than I am, and I'm also very time poor. It's the reason why I use a buyer's agent. And there's the combination. But if I if I was to answer it, if if well, if you put that aside and say, well, I want to use a buyer's agent, I think the very first way to answer the question is just know that there is an absolute difference between a buyer's agent and a property strategist. And mm. sometimes you actually need both uh, unless you have a particular scope. So, you know, you want the four bedroom house with a purple door and a green roof. But if we said, well, you know, we just want a buyer's agent, then the very first thing I would look for is longevity. And, you know, that's Mm -hmm. to the next question or the question beforehand I should say longevity within different market cycles uh, so this is the buyer's agent this is the buyer's agent again. yeah so today with yeah, you can only you can go on Facebook and there's a hundred different buyer's agents monthly and that's really good everyone's got to start somewhere but for me personally I'd like to see them have been doing it as a profession it's a bit of scar tissue been in the game seen a couple of market well, cycles and some and just as importantly some hurt money yeah. as well so they're an investor as well mm. uh, and their money is where their mouth is but particularly around the point that they've experienced different market cycles and that's really really important because as we've talked about before anyone can be a buyer's agent in a good market it's just what's the long standing talent pool so to speak in terms of their property base not the buyer's mm. agent it's easy to be a good buyer's agent in a market which is rising at 70 percent mm. in four years right it's you good know. to be it's easy to be a good investor in a market that's rising at 75 percent in, yeah. in four and years and that's my have point the Midas touch right you know and they don't know what it's like to to actually buy property in a in a softening market yeah and often that's when you need the talent of a good person to actually support you because that's where you can really make your money well i think so but it's also what they entail so mm. there's, there's the buyer's agent we talked about earlier on but i think what is it that they offer uh, as a company, uh, in terms of not just going out and finding the property, but what's the follow on, what's the process, so on and so forth. And then just to keep the answer very short, because we could go on for hours, yeah. 
I would love you to engage a buyer's agent that is a member of PIPA. Okay. So either a corporate or, a, or an individual member of PIPA, which is the property investment professionals uh, of Australia who operate by a code of contact and a conduct. And at least you know then if, they, if you are dealing with a member, there's a very good chance that they operate by that conduct and they're decent people. Okay. So to summarise, you don't have to use a buyer's agent? You don't have to use one. No. Okay. And if you want to use a buyer's agent, understand the difference between being a buyer's agent and a property strategist, two very different things. You guys would fall into the latter, right? You guys are property strategists. As part of that, you do a bit of the stuff you do is the actual buying of the property. Correct? Yeah, and yeah, 100%. Yeah. And just my, and something else just came into my head is perhaps what not to look, or sorry, what to look for that they don't do, and that is full disclosure. Okay. And uh, there are a lot of people that pose as a buyer's agent that perhaps aren't their, their marketing companies. Uh, so you need to know that they're going to be full disclosure and how they earn their money. So if you go and see a buyer's agent, and I'll say that in inverted commas, and they try and sell you an off-the-plan property straight off the bat without asking you what's going on, are they a buyer's agent? No. What are they? They're a marketing company because they haven't taken the time to know what your financial footprint and uh, circumstances are, what your goals are. Yeah, and I think that's you need to be clear about that. Understand who the person you're dealing with operates on behalf of who pays them, and 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 if you yeah. if, if a buyer's agent is a no fee buyer's agent, they're getting paid somehow, and it's obviously uh, uh, their master is not um, probably your best your best interest. But look, mm. you know, on on you guys again, you've got plenty of this stuff on your website, so go and check it out. Um, uh, really understand the DNA of what a buyer's agent and or a property strategist is. But uh, as Sharma, uh, you think in the right way. Um, hopefully that's completely transparent. It's as transparent as we can be because it is, that's just the way it is. Yeah, right. it's pretty simple. It is the way it is. Um, Victor, this question is for you. Uh, this is from Stephen uh, Chen. Uh, we met a few months ago at one of your events in Parramatta. Uh, it was a very informative session, which then got me onto your podcast. The question I have is that in my portfolio, I already have a strong Sydney Portfolio. I'm oh, sorry, I already have a strong portfolio in Sydney, Queensland and Melbourne. And should I start looking in regional areas? So this is really a diversification question. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. What's your thoughts? Yep. Look, it, it, it would come back to uh, what, what they're trying to achieve and uh, where their baseline portfolio is. And I'm assuming that by having the properties in Sydney, um, uh, Brisbane and Melbourne, mm. that um, they've got the baseline covered. In other words, they've got uh, the necessary properties to um, uh, possibly uh, generate the income that they that they want out of it, uh, whether whether it is income via sell down of some properties or whether it is actually the unencumbered rental income by other means. Once you've sorted that out, that'll then point you in the direction of uh, where you need to buy, what you need to buy. Mm. It, it may be a point of you know uh, just repeating the same. Um, there's no such thing as oversaturation in uh, in the larger markets. Uh, whereas if you went to regional areas, uh, certainly you can get overexposed. Uh, I'm not against regional areas. But I, I think that the better money and the more liquidity at this point in the property cycle is within the metropolitan areas. And certainly look at um, uh, the entities you're buying in and the um, uh, way you're buying these properties in, in each area, in each state, to see what sort of level of exposure there is so that you've uh, taken into account land tax and so forth, and then go from there. So I think that the the difference between different regional areas as well, because if you talk about Melbourne, they classify mm. Geelong, Geelong as, regional, as yeah. regional, whereas that would be the equivalent of Sydney saying that Gosford is, is regional. regional. Yeah, um, Regional doesn't necessarily mean mm. you know, a one-trick pony town. Mm. So what you're saying is that you can't be oversubscribed in the city market, you reckon? No, I, don't, I, don't, no. I don't think so, right? Because so if you had 200 properties in Sydney, you'd be pretty happy about you'd that. You'd still be pretty happy about it, right? Yeah. But of course, you know, there needs to be a rationale as to why you have 200 properties in, in Sydney alone mm-hmm. because then, then you're entirely dependent on how that state goes because each, each state has got a different uh, cycle. So it, it, look at it right now. Uh, Sydney is uh, coming off a peak. Uh, Brisbane is taking off. Uh, if you read all the, all the media articles, right? I wish it uh, did. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, interestingly yeah. enough, it was one of the only states to show some in all growth. Th- so yeah, in all three growth. levels. Yeah. yeah. Mm. Well, everyone's waiting around. It's like waiting for Godot, isn't it? No, that's a it's a, yeah, it's a literature reference, Steve. You yeah. can keep up with that. But uh, <laughs> I love that. <laughs> yeah, but I think I think uh, <laughs> oh, there uh, it is, Vic. Did you no, hear that? Behave, yeah. behave boys. Behave. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think uh, a lot a lot of us in uh, you know myself included, uh, we've been tainted. Uh, to some degree by the phenomenal growth we've had in Sydney. And we're using the same template to judge how a different area, different state is doing. Mm. And we need to correct that for its population and to what the general trend is for that state. And if you look at Brisbane as an example, 
Brisbane has never been a, a near vertical performer. It's 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 um, gone through its cycle, but they're shallower cycles, uh, and that's something that we need to be mindful of uh, mm. when we're comparing that against Sydney. Oh, look, you know, I I, I fall into that trap you know I think, no i well, do too yeah, yeah you know what why why isn't brisbane doing what sydney mm. did and uh i think anyone who purchased property um at the right time in sydney think they had the Midas touch right mm. you know and uh we've all got reasonably sized portfolios which have good exposure in the city market and we've all done really well out of that right but we can't expect to emulate that in other parts of the market even if brizzy gave us sort of five ten percent a year i'd be pretty happy but that's right you know anyway uh there's a lot again lots of stuff written about the brisbane market and uh all indicators are that we should see some growth over time. So um, go and check it out. Uh, next question. And we're, we're moving through these pretty quickly, but I want to cover a lot of ground. Um, uh, uh, hello, uh, Victor and Steve. Been listening to you guys and reading your blogs for nearly 10 years and know that you have been investing for double that. Uh, what are some of the mistakes you have made that you can share with us? P.S. Uh, love your work and the no-nonsense approach you guys have. That's uh, from Rebecca. Rebecca's from Fern Tree Gully in Melbourne. You have been at this for a while, haven't you? Been a Steve? while. Yeah. yeah. Been a, a long of, time. Couple, couple, of, couple of cycles. You've been actively oh, buying dozen, through a couple of cycles, right? dozen cycles, depending yeah. on which state you look at. Yeah. Biggest mistakes. We spoke about um, uh, buying a holiday home to, to mm. uh, as a uh, <laughs> potential uh, investment that you've that you've used. What else you got? You know. Um, um, what I like about you guys and. There isn't much, but what I do like about you, I was, just, I was gonna. One of the biggest mistakes I've ever made in investing is associating with associating you. With <laughs> way back when, but um, uh, you guys are happy to, to talk about where, where you could have done better, and I think that's a, a very reflective way to be a, a property investor. And the best investors I know are happy to talk about um, where, where their, their, their shortcomings or their mistakes or the challenges that they face because it makes them better over time. So if you don't have that mindset, if you think you got the Midas touch and everything you do turns to gold, um you're going to come unstuck at some point, so be reflective. But Steve, um, biggest mistakes, biggest missed opportunities maybe? Other than the off-the-plan holiday rental timeshare on the water scenario, uh, which is way up there, I would I would say probably overthinking mm. in, the, in the early stages. So a little bit of procrastination thrown in as well, analysis paralysis. But um, once you get over that as an investor in terms of the procrastination, you tend to go sort of full flight into it if that's the way you're wired, mm. um, which is where the mistake is because you soon start to let go of reality in terms of your cash flow and predictions and, and modelling. But the beauty of that as well, you only do it once. And I, you know, I believe if you make the mistakes, you do become a better investor as the years go on because you get to experience perhaps what other people haven't experienced. And yeah. that actually goes back into one of the – prior questions about longevity, different market Mm -hmm. cycles. So for me, not controlling cash flow earlier on or just Mm -hmm. thinking everything was going to be blue sky. I I think um, when when we talk to a lot of clients that have got uh, multiple properties, uh, one of the common things they come back with is saying that, you know, one of their earlier mistakes is not going hard enough in the the early stages um, where they were too... Um, too slow, or, or, or building the, the portfolio a bit too slowly. Yeah. Um, again, you know, there's there's no right or wrong because you don't know that uh, at that time. So as you get ma- get more experience, you realize that you could have gone harder back mm. then. And um, one of one of the other things that in my portfolio, one of the things that I did, which was um, you know virtually paralyzing uh, in terms of being able to buy more properties, is is doing a subdivision before I actually had the full knowledge or the team behind me to be able to do that. And I did one in Brisbane where it took me pretty much out of the market uh, for about two years. Okay. Mm. So often it's the properties that you don't buy can be an enabler for, for portfolio growth versus the properties that you do buy. And, uh, Absolutely. Uh, and, and when you look at the stats, you know, most property investors have one property. Um, mm-hmm. And the reason why is that they typically buy the wrong property initially and it just hampers their growth or evolution of their portfolio over time. So I think that's a really good answer because you, we've both given different answers and, mm-hmm. it, and it shows our personality type. So Vic is, Vic is more at a bull at a gate. So you know, not, let's not buy one, let's buy two, mm. like for his own personal portfolio. And I'm perhaps more conservative, so let's just buy one at a time. But that shows two different personality right. types, but yep. the same the same outcome. The other the other thing that I think for me was a big mistake is when I first started, there was nobody around that could actually 
point you in the right direction. Mm. You, you had to rely upon the, the advice of a real estate agent, which was pretty yep. dodgy to begin with. Or a handful of books like Jan Summers stuff. That's well, all that was yeah. around back Pretty then. much that was yeah. the only that book. That was the around. only book. And yeah. Yeah, I know I, I read a couple of American books and I tried to you know, convert that into Australian. to Australianism. Mm. And so we had to just do it. And yeah, if it worked, well, tick. If it didn't work, well, let's not mm. do that again. Whereas today, I think you can surround yourself with the right people. Yeah, and that goes back to uh, S. Sharma's question around um, choosing a buyer's agent. You want someone who's actually got this scar tissue, right, who's mm. been there, done that, mm-hmm. and, and and you're paying for someone else's experience by using a buyer's agent. But, yeah, I, I'll sort of sit with both you guys in terms of biggest mistakes in my portfolio is that I could have done so much more at the early phase. I wish I probably could have doubled the amount of property I, I bought in Sydney back then, but mm-hmm. there's mm-hmm. reasons for it, right? You know, um, time constraints, um, not being as experienced an investor as I am right now, not really understanding how I could have um, managed the cash flow, which I could have at that point in time. So it's nice to be reflective and, and retrospective on this stuff, but, you know, can't complain. But you've got to keep it in perspective as well, oh, right? So <laughs> <laughs> you have to keep it in perspective in the sense that um, if you look at the 2011 stats, it was 1.8 million uh, property investors in Australia, yeah. uh, out of which only 16,000 had more than six properties. Mm. Um, fast forward that to 2015, 2 million investors, a little bit over 2 million investors out of a population of 25 mil. Uh, back then it was 23, I suppose. Uh, and uh, the number of property investors that have got more than six properties is only 22,000. So it's like, it hasn't increased substantially. Obviously, with with now that the knowledge is there with the podcasts and and um, the um, uh, seminars and so forth, there's a lot more people that are owning multiple properties, but it's still a very very small amount. So twenty five thousand of a population of uh, twenty five twenty thousand of a population twenty five million zero point zero nine percent of the population own more than nine investment properties. Correct. So more than six. There's not a lot. Is that mm-hmm. so not more than six? That's mm-hmm. tiny. Very That's small, tiny. very small amount. Tiny. Is it though, really? Considering how much information is out there now, like so, you know, there's well, there was multiple magazines, there's internet forums and websites, and mm. it's like, so much more accessible, right? But correct, I think yeah. I think the, the the human dynamics of you know risk versus reward versus procrastination versus analysis paralysis, it's all still there. You know, mm. there's more information out there, but maybe that's in, it's stopping people from. Maybe there's too much information. Maybe there's too much yeah. information, right? And you don't want to be one of those people. One of the best, the, the best investors I know are people who are informed and educated, but they mm. can make a, a bloody decision, you know. And I think a lot of people can't make that decision for whatever reason it is. Mm. Um, I would have thought there would have been more, like yeah. just with the availability of information and, mm. and now being able to surround yourself with the subject matter experts and you know, what have you to make <coughs> yeah. an informed decision. I, I think I think Phil's hit it uh, right on the head. You know, you, you've got to be able to make a decision. So it's all right to have the information and all mm. that, right? But if you can't make a decision, you're not able to move forward anyway. You put that into perspective also. We're, we're in a situation right now with um, a potential leadership spill, you know, mm. Turnbull's under pressure. Uh, who's going to come in? Are we going to have a Liberal, liberal government moving forward? Is it going to transition to a Labor government? You put that into to context of 0.09% of Australians actually own more than six investment properties, you know, the Labor government not really going to care too much about negative gearing. It's such a small, small Mm -hmm. percentage of the voter base, you know, that um, property investors can make a song and dance and bang the drum around, you know, negative gearing, but there's not that many Australians actually realising the benefits of it in that context. But anyway, Mm. let's not get too politicised. It's not our job, uh, responsibility to do that right now. do you think that, Steve? Uh, yeah. <laughs> I'm keeping away from that. I, I see things a little different, but anyway. Now, come on, tell me, how do you see it? Come well, on. nice lead-in. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I, I think that whether they do or don't, for me, and we're talking about the whole you know, negative gearing debate, Yeah. I really don't care Yeah. at the end of the day. There'll be an opportunity either way, um, and sometimes that opportunity just may be a little bit more delayed mm. to be able to execute. Um. I just think it's, once again, whether it happens or not, there's a lot of other noise that you should be concentrating on mm. uh, as an investor rather than that. So, sorry, Vic, so you said there's 2 million property investors out of 25 mm. million and only 20,000 own more than Correct. six investment properties. Mm-hmm. So are you a, it's a drawing a long bow, but six properties or more, you'd like to think you're a reasonably sophisticated property mm-hmm. investor, right? So um, <clears throat> if two, out of 2 million, that means there's 1.98 million property investors that own less than six properties. That, that's that a, that's a still a reasonable voter base. And, and that's you a, good, would, that's mm, a good voter base you know, if, if, if they were to be real about it. But mm. yeah, that's not going to – there's not going to be much sway there. Yeah. 
Anyway, maybe we can touch on that. If, if um, I'm, I'm happy to sort of debate the pros and cons of uh, negative gearing and how a, a changing uh, government might shape and, and influence how us as property investors are going to move forward. Maybe it's a thing for another time. But, yeah. You know, mm-hmm. as we get closer to the election, let's touch on that. And if, if you want to do that, um, um, how can people uh, – it's questions at rightpropertygroup.com. That's right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yep. Uh, email in and uh, – we're, ha- we're happy to do that. Let's um, let's move on to two more questions. I think we can get done. Uh, hi, guys. Uh, I will try and keep my questions very brief, and it will be great to hear your <laughs> we'll thoughts. We'll keep our okay. answers sure. really brief. All right, <laughs> here we go. Uh, where would you buy if you're starting out now, and what strategies would you use to get the best results? That's not a brief question. Also, why do you buy in areas that you buy? <laughs> <laughs> How long we got? Uh, okay, let's break this down. Uh, if you're starting out right now, if you want to join the two million property investors out of these 25 million Australians right now, where would you buy? Depends on your financial footprint, but yeah. let's just think, generally speaking. Uh, let, let's do some assumptions. You, 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 you're you earning the average salary of $75,000 a year and uh, there's two people in your household, so you've got a combined income of $150,000 and your expenses are pretty reasonable. You don't have too much credit card debt or anything else and you've got a deposit of $60,000. What do you do? Got kids? No. Nah. Anytime soon though? Mm-hmm. You got to take that into account as well. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And uh, and have you got aging parents you need to look after mm-hmm. them? Uh, um, are you going to change jobs at any point in time? Um, you know, what other factors do you have which can throw into the <laughs> look, mix? Uh, I think there is no assumptions, is there? Well, this, that's the point, right? Yeah. So I think look, if just very, very, very general. Uh, if you only were starting with how much did you say? Sixty k. Sixty k. Sixty k. Depending on the LVR, I'd be looking for something that's going to generate uh, better than. Average growth, I might have to do a bit of a renovation because my capital's limited, cash flow's not a problem. I would be looking for something that needs work in perhaps Brisbane. Okay. Uh, and it's largely because we've got limited capital to begin with. Correct. Yeah. Yep. You, you, you won't be able to buy a substantial property here in, in Sydney uh, with a $60,000 capital. Is it pretty normal though? Like when, when you guys deal with, with investors of all shapes and sizes, um, mm. what's the sort of common average, median, whatever you want to call it, um, Investor, potential investor that you see, is that sort of- There is no average. There is no average. No. Everyone's different. So the point is everyone's different. Everybody's different. That's why I was trying to be very general, I suppose, tongue in cheek, because, Mm. you know, plugging you for for more questions on the scenario is because it isn't just that simple. Mm. Uh, Well, the second part of this question then, and what strategy would you you use to get the best results is- Well, once again- It depends. Yeah. It depends on who you are and what you do. Yeah, no, that's, that, that's why we tailor make the uh, uh, portfolios for mm. our clients is we, we sit down with them, map out a plan uh, based on their goals and the and their financial capabilities so that they're not just buying a property, they're, they're buying towards a goal and they're buying it uh, safely so that if things were uh, to change in their life, such as you know addition to a family or change mm. in employment and so forth, they don't have to then put the reset button on. Uh, and and, and uh, sell the property. They can continue holding onto that property. Yeah, the next property will be bought when their household budget allows. Correct. And for yeah. us, we you know, we look at it a little bit different too. So yeah, there's the obviously the 25 year goal plan. There's a 100 year goal plan. Whatever it may be, or the, mm. or the short term. But we look at it and design a decade. Mm. That's the easiest mm-hmm. way to look at what can you do in the next decade very comfortably and very uh, strategically and safely. So this goes back to the question around um, buyers agents. What you're talking about here is being property strategist. Two That's a strategist, agents. correct. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Okay, cool. All right. And this is the last question is from Glenn. What's the difference between strata and community title? Uh, well, so strata is where you, uh, to really simplify it, there's a little bit more to it, but to really simplify it, if you, if you own a property in a block of units, as an example, you're really technically owning from the paint inwards. Uh, that's your piece of real estate, whereas um, everything else is owned commonly by all of the owners, so uh, it comes under the strata title. Whereas the uh, community title is a blend of your torrents title and strata title. Torrents title is where you actually own the land mm. uh, the, the property sits on. So a good example would be uh, a lot of these uh, townhouses in, say, Brisbane, as an example, where you own from the fence inwards. So in okay. other words, you've got exclusive use to your backyard. It belongs to you. The backyard belongs to you under exclusive use. Um, and um, therefore, technically, you then have to take out insurance on your building. Whereas uh, in the previous scenario with the strata... would cover the building insurance. The, yes, I think that's, that's right. the really that's the key to that. Mm. Um, that Well, that's a good answer to the, to the question because... I always give good answers, Steve. You do. That you do. It's um, adequate answers. Adequate. Thanks. Big word. It's. Um, I think the insurance is the is the key there because yes. if you're getting the wrong type of insurance under a community title, 
yeah, scenario. I think, I, I think a lot of people yeah. get tripped up if, if they have a claim, uh, whereas they think it's covered under strata. Because often you have, particularly in Brisbane, you've got a combination of strata and community titles. Well, you're also responsible for the building insurance. Mm. So the strata is not, or the, the strata fund, which they both still have, aren't paying for it. So sure, a, a, an easy way to perhaps look at it is one's defined by the 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 walls of the premises. The other one is defined by the wall, uh, the, or the boundary. Yep. Well, the the fences. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And yeah. you are in t- uh, you are responsible for the insurance, mm. the building insurance under a community title, not under insu- uh, strata title, but double check all the time. Do you have a blog on this on your website? Maybe not. Yeah, we, we do. Yeah, get one. Yeah, yeah, way back. Okay. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah, go and check it out. All right, last question, Steve. What are the tips that the average person, and I think there is no average person, can employ to increase serviceability? Easiest one is non-productive debt, get rid of it. So credit cards, car loans, high purchase, furniture, Harvey Norman cards. Mm-hmm. Um, get rid of everything. Everything that is- Paid off first before you even think about investing in property? I think, minimizes. well, speak to the speak to your finance strategist because there might be that inflection point where you your serviceability gets good after you've paid down a certain amount. But mm. I think every investor, or every person, forget just being an investor, every person shouldn't have credit card debt. It's just- Badness. It's just the modern form of slavery. Mm. Okay. Um, how else do you increase serviceability? Get a pay rise helps. To put your rents up, get a pay rise. Ask. Mm. <laughs> We're just looking. Um, yeah, get a second job, side hustle, whatever. How bad do you want it? Side hustle? You've been watching too many American things. Everyone's got a side hustle in the States. <laughs> What's your side you know hustle? What? I used to, when I first started, I had a side hustle. Yeah. I had multiple side hustles. hustles. Yeah. yeah. What's your side hustle, Victor? <laughs> Got none. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, all right. It's good. I'm happy with that. We covered a lot of ground. Yeah. Um, but I think uh, what do you do if you want more information, Victor? You've got plenty of blogs on this stuff. Yes, absolutely. Just yep. uh, go into our website. Um, uh, there's quite a few blogs on there. And uh, if you've got anything specific, uh, send us an email, questions at rightpropertygroup.com.au. Okay, good. I think that'll do us for today. Over time again. Go with it. Yeah, really cool. Good to see you back, mate. It's, Same uh, here. Keep going. And, and uh, if there's any topics that you would like us to cover as part of uh, uh, Series 2 of Investing Insights with the Right Property Group, let us know. Um, we're happy to do anything, really, as long as not, you know, too spurious or strange <laughs> or weird. Yeah, let us know. Uh, we're happy to cover anything. Like, um, uh, as Victor said, remember to check out uh, rightpropertygroup.com.au. Uh, plenty of info there and uh, invaluable information. We'll be back again next time. Until then, bye-bye.